Okay. Uh, well, thanks everybody for having me, um, and thank you for that very kind introduction. Uh, so I am uh, uh, increasingly these days a specialist in violent extremism in West Africa, but I have been working on the continent, and particularly in northern Nigeria, since long before the conflict started. Um, I was actually the last American Fulbright scholar based in northern Nigeria before Boko Haram began. And so my perspective on these issues comes from being a political scientist who studies things like political participation and mobilization, um, who came to violence because violence happened, rather than somebody who had started primarily interested in violent extremism. Um, I've done a lot of work, however, in violent extremism. I've written reports for USAID and the US Institute for Peace. Uh, and I'm very happy to be able to share with you today some of what I uh, think about these issues. Ah, here we go. OK, um, and so what I'm going to be doing today is giving sort of an overview of CVE issues um, in the context of Africa, and then talking a little bit about how we know, or what, what we know about whether or not these efforts are effective or whether or not they work, and what it would take to know more about whether or not they're effective. Okay, uh, so you know, what is violent extremism? How is it distinct from terrorism? This is a concept that has a specific intellectual lineage um, that really does come out of the US experience after um, the early 2000s. The language of violent extremism emerges in US-based policy discourse um, for a couple of reasons. One was as a recognition that there is a lot of complexity around the ways that people come to engage in violence. Um, and there's a need to understand the forms and types of participation that people have in extremist organizations. The sort of understanding the totality of the extremist project rather than just their sort of being terrorists and non-terrorists. And the other, of course, had a lot to do with the politicized language of terrorism, particularly in the US conflict. But I think that this is true in other parts of the world as well. Um, that theoretically, by adopting this lens, where we talk less about sort of the specific act and more about the entirety of the organizations and the people who participate in them, we can recognize commonalities between these groups that we might otherwise miss. So for example, scholars in the US talk a lot about the potential similarities between white nationalist organizations in the US or groups or supporters of those groups and Salafi jihadists in, say, for example, the Middle East or West Africa. And I think that this is a powerful lens for recognizing that this is a um, a form of violence that is not sort of restricted to any particular ideological claim, right? That it's a, it's a description and, a, and a, a guess about how people come to participate. The other thing that you need to know, of course, is that CVE is a sort of soft approach. It's often described that way, that it's a departure from the older way of sort of thinking about counterterrorism and coin doctrine, sort of moving beyond clear, hold, and build in the way that, for example, the US Army thought about things in the mid-2000s in Iraq, towards the idea that if vulnerability to violent extremism is a structural force, right, if, the, if, if communities or, or individuals are susceptible to participation in violent extremist groups because of the nature of the situation that they find themselves in, then what we need is a set of policy doctrines or an approach that disaggregates the causes and forces that drive participation, and that thinks about both active participants and communities that are at risk of potential participation or impact by violent extremism. So that's the basic theory here. Now, what's unique about this approach is that it is both a theory and a solution. There is a circular nature to it, right? It both defines the problem and proposes a solution which means that it's going to matter a lot whether or not this all bears out empirically in the studies that we undertake about whether or not our propositions about <clears throat> CVE are correct. But the theory behind CVE is that if violent extremism is caused by the vulnerabilities of communities to VE groups and their ideology, then we need to figure out what those vulnerabilities are, cluster <clears throat> them, and then think about what kind of mobilization, either through security services or social mobilization activities of governments or NGOs, would work to counter those factors. And CVE doctrine generally clusters these factors into two groups, so-called pull factors and push factors. And I suspect a lot of you have heard this language before. And I like this as a metaphor because it very visually invokes the experience that people are having in their journey towards violent extremism here. That on one hand, we have the forces that are behind people pushing them, right? They're not forces that are being sought out by these individuals. They're things that are in the background, right? Social marginalization, an absence of good uh, government policy or efficacy in an area, police harassment and corruption, poverty, unemployment. These are things behind people shoving them into violent extremism. And then there are the pull factors, 
the things that the violent extremist groups might themselves be doing, right? Access to material resources or things that these groups can provide. Access to material resources, access to social status, a sense of belonging or adventure, right? Or particular religious doctrines or teachings that might be influential. Right? So we disaggregate theoretically between these push factors behind people and pull factors that are bringing them into groups. It's also useful to note that CVE comes with an implicit theory of change, a theory <clears throat> about where violent extremism comes from and specifically about what kinds of efforts would make the most sense to address it. And so I'd like to run through this. This isn't mine. This is borrowed from a Dutch researcher. Um, but I think it does a good job of explaining how CVE thinks about these problems. And so I make a couple of observations here. One, if you look at the far right-hand side here, you'll note that the actual group of people, the extremists, are by far the smallest group, right? And this is extraordinarily important. Of all of the people who are vulnerable because of the communities that they live in, who are vulnerable for social psychological reasons, who are targeted by extremist groups, in any circumstances that we are aware of in Africa or elsewhere, only a very small proportion of those people will ever actively participate in a violent extremist organization. And if you look at the violent extremist organizations that are active on the continent today, they are not mass movements. They are not movements with tens of thousands of followers. Recent uh, US government estimates from AFRICOM suggested in the part of the world that I work in, in the Lake Chad Basin, six or 7,000 active participants in violent extremism. I've seen Nigerian estimates that bring that number up to 25,000. In a community of 80 million people who might theoretically be defined as theoretically potentially at risk, we're talking about a very small rate of conversion. That's an important part of this theory. But the other part is this kind of big pool on the left-hand side. And the language here that she uses, the scholar, is intentionally provocative. She calls it breeding ground. And this is supposed to be sort of pointing out the challenges or the difficulties with this approach. She's not adopting this language without knowing that it's provocative. On one hand, it's true in CVE doctrine that communities that are vulnerable or at risk are potentially places where even sort of unidentifiable or untargetable individuals might become motivated to participate in VE. But it is very, very easy to tip over from that awareness that some communities are vulnerable into thinking about those communities as undifferentiated masses of people who form a risk to the state. And again, I think if some of you think about the experiences that we've seen on the continent in the last 15 or 20 years, you can think of policies or examples that have tipped over into treating those communities as undifferentiated masses of people who pose a threat. This is a danger inherent in this approach. On one hand, we recognize that some communities are vulnerable. On the other hand, we have to recognize that this doesn't mean that communities need to automatically be securitized or treated as a potential threat merely because they are potentially vulnerable. That's important, an important part of CVE doctrine. Moreover, CVE doctrine is, I think, complicated on the question of radicalization, what radicalization is, or what it means to be an extremist. It is a discipline or a doctrine that explicitly often does not take a definitional stand on what it means to be an extremist or a radical, recognizing in large part that it's fundamentally about behavior rather than belief. What makes someone a violent extremist is that they engage in violence as much as any sort of doctrine or belief that they have. And the drivers that, in, that cause people to engage in violence are often far more complicated than a simple statement of they're extremists. Right? This is based into CVE, this is baked into CVE doctrine. Right? Now, a lot of you have probably heard this from your local religious actors in your countries, right? That not all sort of adherents of a particular tradition are inherently extremist. Um, that there are traditions that are sometimes coded or treated as extreme by Western actors, by governmental actors where the vast, vast, vast majority of people will never engage in any anti-state violence, or any violence at all. And that's an important thing that CVE recognizes, and yet struggles to program with. It is too easy to sometimes engage in programming to tackle those areas that are vulnerable that ends up making them look like they're all potential committers of violent extremism. So that's a caution. How does this hold up <clears throat> against research? What do we actually know about whether or not this is an accurate description of the world? 
Well, a lot of this is, in fact, supported by evidence. And here I'm going to reference a couple of things. One is the landmark 2017 study conducted by the UNDP, the Journey to Extremism in Africa report. And another is a, a paper that I'm happy to share if people ask, um, produced by uh, USAID in 2016 based on a survey across much of West Africa. And what they find is pretty consistent with that CVE theory that the biggest and most important drivers of participation in violent extremism are the experience and perception of marginalization. Right? Communities that are historically peripheral or marginal to state authority tend to produce more VE groups and movements. Individuals and communities that are historically marginal within their national context or setting are more likely to produce VE groups and participants. We see that, for example, lack of education or access to education and security for children is correlated with future VE participation. We see, and again, the research bears this out very clearly, that economics are a powerful driver of violent extremist, extremism. This survey that was conducted as part of the UNDP report found that unemployment was like 20 percent percentage points higher among the participant group than it was among the control group suggesting that, again, economic drivers play a key role in people's choices. Also, we know that there are pull factors here, um, that groups will offer economic inducements, and this has been demonstrated a lot in the kind of case study literature, and they find evidence of that as well. How about religion? Religion was the largest single response that interviewees who had participated in VE gave when they, asked, when they were asked, why did you participate in VE? But it was only 40%. You could read that the other way, as saying the majority of people who participate in VE groups in Africa don't say that religion was their primary motivation in, in joining. More importantly, and this is where I like this USAID study that's a much broader survey, gets at 7,500 people, we find that one of the largest drivers of a sort of acceptance of VE in your community, not from participants, but from people living in threatened communities, is the sense that your religion, your culture, your community is at risk from whatever force that might be from, right? This sense that my religion is under attack, it's under siege, it's being challenged or its validity is being questioned does seem to drive support for violent extremism. Distrust of government and grievances against the political system also make for vulnerable populations. This literature is very clear on this, but, and this is, I think, <clears throat> crucial. When the, the research that UNDP did summarized the kind of tipping point experience that people had that tipped them from being sympathetic to active participants, well, well, well over half the single largest answer that we got was people who had an experience with state violence. That was the thing that drove them to go from being sort of sympathetic or wary to actively engaging or participating, an experience of being targeted, them or their family, for violence by the state. Okay, so what do we do with this? What does this mean for policy? I think a lot of you probably come from places where there are CT or CVE national action plans that incorporate some of these findings. This is great. This is really important. Having these kinds of policies in place, these action plans, is a big first step. But how do we know if they're working? How do we know if the proposals, the policies, the projects that emerge out of these action plans are actually having the effect of reducing the vulnerability of communities to violent extremism. The honest truth is that for large part we don't know whether or not they're working and there are a number of reasons why. One reason is because a lot of these plans, these action plans, are created without that explicit theory of change. If you're going to have any impact, and I teach development to master students, to 24-year-olds who are bright and eager to go out in the world and make a difference, and I say, when you want to do a project, when you want to go out and start a program, you have to have a clear idea in advance of how the thing you want to do will create the change that you want. I meet a lot of young people who say, I want to go teach so football. I want to go teach sports. It's going to empower people. Well, what do you mean by empowerment, and how specifically is it going to do that? Do you have five or six sources that can demonstrate that that pathway actually exists in the world. The same is true for violent extremist um, effort, or countering violent extremist efforts or CT efforts. What's your theory of change? How are the activities that you're proposing actually leading to the outcome <clears throat> you want? This is often not written into those action plans. Another issue that comes up consistently in CVE program, particularly that, that's funded um, by external actors, is that contact is not impact. Simply reaching people with your CVE programming doesn't guarantee that they're listening or that they're changing their attitudes, their beliefs, or their actions. 
far, far, far too many assessments of CVE programmings today continue to list, we contacted X number of people or we broadcast to a group of this number of people as their outcome. But this tells us nothing about whether or not they had the impact that was intended. Now, in order to measure the impact of these programs, we do have to think clearly in advance about what we can measure. It is important to drill down and identify things that we can see in the world, right? If we're not able to survey everybody who participates in a CVE program afterwards, it does mean that we have to construct our CVE programming around things that we can demonstrate. The reason we rely on contact in this research is because contact is easy to demonstrate. You look at the sign-up sheet at the end, or you count how many people, you know, by heads who came to the programming. But again, that's not the same as knowing whether or not the programming worked. You have to have clear objectives in mind. And then, and that's what this little um, graphic here is at the top, you have to have a plan for using that information to change your programming. If you're doing the same CVE programming you were five years ago, you're probably not assessing it, collecting data, and using that data to make your programming better. We also know from the UNDP study that distrust of CVE programming and its sponsors is a deterrent to success. People cite concerns about the sources of those programs as a reason to distrust them or dismiss them. Now, you can't always help where the money is coming from for this kind of programming, but you can show by building trust, capacity, and efficiency that these programs work, that they have a material impact on the lives of people, and that helps to mitigate some of that distrust or that fear that that outside or external money is shaping the programming. And then finally, and I'm going to have one more slide after this that gets at this point, the different goals that you might have for P or CVE efforts, we could think about deradicalization, we could think about desistance, right, an, an end to participation in violence, or community resiliency. They require different kinds of assessment and evaluation. And frankly, they require different kinds of programming. You can't assess a program or even run a program the same way if you've got a group of people in a prison that you can in a rural village. Right? Fundamentally different approaches. This is a theory rather than a prescription about here are the three things that you do. So what do we know about what works and what doesn't? Well, one of the things that we know is that de-radicalization and rehabilitation effort program programs for former combatants do sometimes work. But it depends a lot on who you're targeting. The best efforts have largely come from targeting people who are not what we might think of as the sort of hard cases, right? People who got sucked up into these groups because of push factors rather than pull factors. We know, and I'm happy to talk about this more during the question period, that gender matters a lot. We know that women join VE organizations or participate in VE for different reasons than men. And we know that in part because the programming has been one size fits all up to this point, often, that programming that's directed at men and women fails women at a higher rate than it fails men. This suggests that you need a specific kind of gender set of programs in order to be effective. You also have to think about the role of gender in your programming. There was a wonderful study came out a year and a half ago um, from Great Britain pointing out that a lot of CVE policy adopted in Africa was based on the implicit assumption that mothers will be able to tell when their sons are joining VE groups. Turns out that this is not always true, right? We can also treat women as exceptional in ways that are not helpful for thinking about doing this programming well. This is useful. Also, it matters whether or not you care about changing hearts and minds or just behavior. Do you want to de-brainwash people, or do you simply want them to stop engaging in violence? It matters which one of those your goal is for the kind of programming you do. And you have to think about what your real priorities are when you do this. And then finally, for almost all other CVE efforts, the results have been very mixed and context-specific. My sort of example that I like to bring out is counter-communication and education efforts, right? Um, counter-messaging efforts. The assessment work that's been done suggests very little clear evidence that those programs work. That throwing up a radio program to teach moderation, right, or advance particular religious leaders or actors over others. We can't say for sure that it doesn't work, but we also can't say in any meaningful way that it works either. And when it does seem to work, it seems to take a long time to work. Years and years and years. Other kinds of programs built around building community resiliency or engagement are very hard to assess, at least in part because defining what a resilient community is, is very difficult. If you read studies in this area, when you say, what's a resilient community? They say one where violence doesn't happen. OK, why doesn't violence happen in that community? Because it's resilient. We see this a lot in the academic literature. We don't really quite know exactly why those communities are different. Is it that people have deeper social networks, that they engage more with people who are not like them ethnically or religiously? Those are hypotheses. 
but in Kenya, in Uganda, in Nigeria, in Niger, and Mali, we don't quite know if that's true or not. The research has been, to this point, still pretty limited. And so thinking about how you might go about doing this program means having a clear end goal in mind, an idea of what your outcomes are going to be. And then understanding that making a community more resilient might not mean an end to the violence. A lot of these programs can work and you can still have a, a violence problem. Right? They are not panaceas to your security problems. There are ways to make communities stronger, more resilient, less susceptible to violent extremism, but they may not prevent all violent extremism from happening. That doesn't mean that they're not being effective. It means that you have to think about them as having different goals. And on that point, I think I'll end. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah.